So the following is going to be a brief tutorial on perianal fistulas. And before we get going and talking about how they look like on imaging and the classification scheme, let's start uh, and review a little bit of the anatomy of this, lo of this region as it's critical to kind of understanding uh, what these fistulas look like. And when we talk about anatomy, we're really focusing on the anus. And as it turns out, the anus is really uh, the distalmost portion of the large bowel, and it ranges anywhere from about three to five centimeters in length. And uh, we define it from an anatomic and surgical perspective as that portion of the bowel that's really below the level of the puborectalis muscle. So we can see the puborectalis muscle here coming from the uh, pubic symphysis uh, bone going all the way around and slinging over the posterior portion of the bowel and it's actually going to go all the way across and sling over again. And everything above that is going to be the large bowel. It's going to be the rectum and sigmoid colon. And everything below it, from this location here essentially, all the way down to the anal verge, is going to be the anus. So that's the puborectalis muscle over here. And in terms of histological evaluation of the anus, we can see on this coronal schematic, the uh, distal half, really, of the anus is going to be composed of the same cells that you find in the skin, so squamous uh, epithelium cells. And as they go, um, there's a transition zone into more uh, columnar epithelial cells as seen in the remainder of the large bowel. And that transition zone is actually called the dentate line. And it consists of a bunch of crypts that you can see in this location over here. So that's going to be the uh, dentate line. And uh, in these crypts, you have a whole bunch of glands, and that becomes particularly important to appreciate when it comes to figuring out how these perianal fistulas form. So the anus is about three to five centimeters in length, and its real role is as a sphincter. And so what the anus does is it makes sure that uh, we stay continent. It does that really by having two muscles that maintain our continence. And those two muscles are the internal sphincter, so I'll call that IS for internal sphincter, and the external sphincter, and ES. Now the internal sphincter is really contiguous with the circular muscles of the anus. And so what does that really mean is that if you look at the wall of the anus, this on the coronal over here, this is going to be the internal sphincter right over here. And you can see it go all the way up and it's contiguous with the wall of the anus. You can see it on the other side over here. And on this side, it's really going to be this structure over here. That's going to be the internal sphincter. And it maintains our normal uh, resting tone within the anus. And, um, and this is supported by the external sphincter, which is just outside of the anus. And this is going to be the portion of the external sphincter over here and over here. So I'll just mark that on this side. And the external sphincter is seen over here and over here. It's actually contiguous with the puborectalis muscle. It's very difficult to kind of tell them apart sometimes on imaging. And the puborectalis muscle continues upwards and really forms the levator plate. And so you have the levator musculature on this side over here made up of a bunch of muscles. They're actually made up of the pubococcygeus muscle, the uh, puborectalis muscle, and the iliococcygeus muscle. And sometimes it's very difficult to kind of tell these apart. But these make up the uh, levator uh, musculature and the external sphincter, which is a voluntary muscle, is contiguous with the puborectalis portion of the levator musculature. So who gets perianal fistulas? Well, a wide variety of people can get it. People patients with Crohn's disease, it's uh, particularly common. But really any reason for which there may be inflammation in that uh, or repeated bouts of inflammation in that region of the bowel may be associated with radiation therapy, any uh, prior surgery or trauma that somebody has gotten in that location, um, and any, as I said, causes of infection or inflammation. And so why do we really get perianal fistulas? Well, the uh, leading theory is something called the uh, cryptoglandular hypothesis. Uh, this theory says that uh, within the uh, wall of the anus, particularly uh, concentrated in the region of the dentate gland, you have all these glands. So I'll draw a gland over here, for example. And, uh, you know, you can draw a gland over here as well, similar location. And these glands typically uh, will open up into the anal mucosa and will drain out through the anus. Now, for whatever reason, with uh, repeated bouts of inflammation, they may get blocked up. Now, if they get blocked up, there's always the possibility that these then find a different way to decompress. They can also form abscesses as a result. 
and thereby giving you perianal fistulas. So there are a number of types of fistulas that can form, and there are in fact different classification schemes, which I'm not gonna go into right here, but what we'll go through is kind of just describing what can happen, and uh, we'll go through then a checklist of how to describe and what we should include in our report. So the first type of fistula that can form is called a, a superficial fistula. So I'll just write this up here, uh, a superficial fistula. And what really happens uh, in that situation is that you have one of these glands that get blocked up and then they decompress via the anal wall itself. So if you have a gland over here, it will decompress downwards, 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 and uh, go out through the, uh, the anal opening essentially. It will not cross the internal sphincter. It certainly will not cross the uh, external sphincter. And they're relatively uncommon, anywhere from uh, uh, you know, 10 to 20%, uh, about 16% by one series in terms of their incidence. The next type of fistula is uh, one of the more common fistulas. It's called an intersphincteric fistula. I'll just do uh, sphincteric fistula. And that's an important one to know. And so what happens with these fistulas is that you have, again, the blocked anal gland over here. And instead of decompressing to the anal wall, this fistula actually goes through the internal sphincter as such and escapes through the little fat pad between the internal sphincter and the external sphincter. So it's gonna now go in this location over here. And it'll decompress in that location. Uh, and these are, as I said, are fairly common and uh, they can be associated as a simple tract or you can have multiple tracts or abscesses that can form uh, associated with these. So when we describe these, it's important to be able to recognize the multiple tracts or abscesses that form uh, in the context of an intersyncteric fistula. The next type of fistula is a little bit more complex than that, and it's called a transsphincteric fistula. This also tends to be somewhat common. And these transsphincteric fistulas, the uh, anal gland gets blocked, and like the intersyncteric fistula, it goes through the internal sphincter, but instead of decompressing through the intersyncteric fat, these ones go actually through the external sphincter itself and goes downwards into the ischio anal fossa. So these are going to go down in this direction. Uh, they can also be associated with abscesses or multiple tracts, so it becomes very important in order to uh, uh, recognize those and start to describe those. Now the fourth variety is a uh, uncommon variety, but it's one that's important to describe. It's called a supra levator fistula. Now in super levator fistulas you have again the anal mucosal gland that gets blocked. It now goes through the internal sphincter. It goes into the intersyncteric space but instead of decompressing downwards in the intersyncteric space or through the external sphincter these ones go upwards and now decompress through the levator plate and by doing so going upwards now getting into the fat uh, higher up in the pelvis there's a higher chance that these can now infect more visceral organs and other regions of the pelvis. And so these tend to be a little bit more aggressive, or they can be more aggressive in, in terms of how they spread in their infection. And again, this can be like the rest associated with multiple tracts and abscesses. So it's important to be able to recognize those. Now, the last one is a little bit different. And in fact, uh, with this last one, the cryptoglandular hypothesis doesn't quite hold true. And these are the extra sphincteric fistulas. Now these ones have nothing to do with the anus, have nothing to do with the sphincter mechanism, and they in fact arise higher up, uh, probably in the rectum or sigmoid colon somewhere, and then they go through the um, adjacent parapelvic fat pad over here and can do whatever they want. They can go through the levator musculature, they can uh, form abscesses, and so again, uh, these don't really have uh, uh, a good explanation in terms of the cryptoglandular hypothesis, but this is a fifth type of um, fistula that can be seen in this setting. So when we describe these fistulas, there are certain elements that are important to talk about in terms of their description. And so the first element we need to uh, talk about is its origin. And when we talk about the origin, we refer to the anus as uh, like it's a clock. And so we look at the axials, and over here is going to be 12 o'clock, and over here is going to be uh, 3 o'clock, and this is going to be 6 o'clock, and this is going to be 9 o'clock. And so we say that uh, the mucosal opening is seen uh, at a certain uh, clock point, so whether it's 1 o'clock, uh, 4 o'clock, um, and so we talk about that's where the mucosal opening originates from. It's important to also mention the distance of that opening from the anal verge. You can measure that in a number of ways. Typically, you could do it on a sagittal if you can or on a coronal image, and it's important to give that distance as well. Now, of course, it's also important to mention the type of fistulas, 
and uh, oftentimes it's going to be a very complex fistula. So you'll say there's a complex perianal fistula, and you may need to describe a couple of the components, if they're intersphincteric components, transphincteric components. Along with the type of fistulas, it's important to mention there's uh, any abscess, uh, what location, how big the abscess is, and also if there's any abscesses or inflammation, is there any involvement of the muscles, particularly the levator muscles, or any organs? So how real bad is this disease? Is it spreading to other areas? And so typically if I were to describe one of these fistulas, I would say that there is a um, intersphincteric fistula uh, arising from the one o'clock position approximately you know, two centimeters from the anal verge without an associated abscess. And so that would be one uh, relatively succinct way in order to uh, describe the fistulas. So finally, let's finish off by touching a little bit upon how these abscesses and fistulas look like on imaging. And so in terms of how we image them, we use uh, pretty much standard MR sequences. T2-weighted sequence becomes particularly important. Fluid is bright on T2-weighted sequences, so any of these tracts that contain fluid will also be bright on a T2-weighted sequence. In addition, we like T2-weighted sequences with fat saturation. These are particularly good to look for the actual fluid in the uh, tracts. Well, these general T2-weighted sequences are very good at uh, looking at the anatomy and defining really the sphincters with the intersphincteric fat and the external sphincter. We like the uh, T1 uh, weighted sequences both with and uh, without contrast, so plus contrast. And, you know, these are particularly good at delineating the tracks as well. And so it's really just a combination of these uh, three sequences in different planes that is uh, somewhat sufficient in order to image these fistulas. And, you know, we don't routinely use an endoluminal coal, certainly not at our institution. And the only thing I would say is that in terms of angulating uh, our planes, we want to do it with, the, with respect to the anus. So when we do our axial planes, we really do want to do it uh, with respect to the anus in this direction and the coronal planes in this direction. And in terms of what these fistulas and abscesses look like, we're really just looking for a rim-enhancing tract and inside, on the T2-weighted sequences, there's going to be fluid. And on the post-contrast T1-weighted sequences, the tract will enhance, but inside, there will be no signal. And so that's what you're looking for in order to define tracts and where they close up and form more uh, focal uh, regions like that. They're going to be uh, essentially abscesses. We may or may not see gas within these collections, and we may or may not see hemorrhage, uh, depending if there's been uh, any intervention.